Hey, y'all, just so you know, we're going to be talking about this week's episodes of In Treatment. So spoilers are ahead. There's also some explicit language in this podcast. All right, let's start the show. Hey, y'all, my name is Brandon Kyle Goodman. My pronouns are he and they, and I am a writer, actor and activist and a proud queer black person. And I am Dr. Janelle S. Pfeiffer. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a Black woman licensed clinical psychologist and also an academic. I'm also a mom. And welcome to In Session, the official companion podcast of the HBO show In Treatment, where we deconstruct what happens in the show to understand how therapy works. Just as a reminder, the show is not a substitute for therapy. So reach out to a professional if you need. All right, let's get started. It is not essential for the work we do for me to like you or for you to like me for that matter. Okay, so just in a bit, we'll get into what happened on the show this week. But first, we're so excited because today we have an in-treatment insider, David Sigurani, as our guest. So David, tell the people who you are. What are your pronouns? And also let us know what you do on the show. Sure. So I'm David Sigurani. Uh, My pronouns are he, him, his, and they, them, theirs. And I am the showrunner's assistant on In Treatment. I have been assisting Joshua Allen and Jennifer Schur, who are two co-showrunners on the season of In Treatment. And I have come at the show from both a background in TV production and also mental health. So I've, for the last six years, have been a crisis counselor on the Trevor Project National Hotline and then also on crisis tech services and all that. So this, this is an amazing sort of synergy of all the things that I love and are meaningful to me. So, David, why bring the show back now? Mm. And what was the thinking behind the character of Dr. Brooke Taylor? Okay, sure. I think I'll start with, you know, why why now and why this was important for, you know, Josh and Jen to bring the show back. And I think it became around a conversation of the pandemic providing this idea of all of us needed to focus on our collective psyches. We were all going through capital T or lowercase t trauma. Mm. Um, We were in a place where mental health was so important to deal with and have a conversation around. And so looking through the HBO library, finding this show that both is possible to produce in a pandemic and Mm. had sort of organically the idea of two actors sitting across from each other distanced, but also talking about really important things that we were all talking about in our homes or in our lives, dealing with isolation, dealing with grief, dealing with just the anxiety of what was going on around us. And I think then the conversation became, who's our way into that? Mm. And Dr. Brooke Taylor being someone that we wanted to represent what America's therapist should look like right Mm -hmm. now. And as someone who comes from addiction, was herself isolated just like we all were and it was easy to go back to the bottle or go back to those struggles and vices that we all internalized during a pandemic and she became someone that we could really have a conversation with the old version and iteration of the show too Mm. and this idea that the old version of the show was something that centered privilege in certain ways and had a certain outlook on patients, we wanted to, you know, really center some really different stories in this version of it. Um, And Jen and Josh did an amazing way of coming in to that through Dr. Taylor. Yes. Well, one of the things that you mentioned was talking about the diversity of the clients that were highlighted in this, um, in, in treatment. And we're curious about these clients. We know that Dr. Brooks sees many clients in a week. So why these three clients in particular? Mm. I think for us, again, it all stemmed from the idea of Dr. Taylor came first and was something that Josh pitched and is something that he centered around the idea of that Black experience and wanting to come at it first and foremost by if she's shutting down her medical office and bringing it into her home, then we wanted to have more intimate conversations around things like race, around things like class inequity, Mm. around things like toxic masculinity, Mm -hmm. narcissism, this idea of addiction, isolation again, and having 
therapy set in someone's mm-hmm. home being something that then became super intimate, broke down some of those therapy boundaries that you usually have in a clinical setting or in a clinical office. And I think that's where the idea of these three clients came from. These three clients to us represented intersectionality and identities that weren't explored often on television. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, Josh and Jen did as well is they then sourced writers that themselves had lived an experience and authenticity Mm -hmm. around these Mm -hmm. characters. And so it was almost as if there was autobiographical elements that they could pull Mm. from their own lives that spoke to the journeys of these characters that also spoke to the psyches of these characters as we dug in and sort of built twists and turns around what their therapy life would look like over six weeks as well. Part of what really strikes me about this is that the show is really on this razor's edge where it could be uh, exploitative or really performative and that authenticity that you talked about it seems like the writer's identities and their personal experiences really helped it be something that's respectful and real and deep. Can you talk a little bit more about how you approach this topic, how the writers approach this when they're dealing with something that really is hitting close to home for so many people? Mm, Mm. That's such a good question, Dr. (laughs) Janelle. I want to know that answer. Yes. David? Yeah. (laughs) It's it's interesting because I think for us, it was a process, right? And it was our own version of group therapy. Mm. And it was our own process of opening up a writer's room during a pandemic solely through Zoom. Mm. But really, I think just creating and opening up a safe space where the showrunners led the charge to give everyone a voice. Mm-hmm. Again, we're all sort of boxes on a screen, so it's very egalitarian. And it was there was no hierarchy in the room. Mm-hmm. And it was really lovely to have people join us and open up about their mm-hmm. lives. And yeah. everyone themselves had been in therapy or was currently still in mm-hmm. therapy. Um, Jen talks about all the time how she's been in therapy with the same therapist for 17 mm-hmm. years. Oof, and yes. so to her, it's one of the most important relationships she has in her life. Yeah. It's such a impactful thing that we wanted to all dig into mm-hmm. and we wanted to be that for each other and also know that things that were said or things that were dug up were, you know, completely safe mm-hmm. and would stay within the room. But also if there were details of that that ended up in the scripts, that ended up in the stories, that we would protect sort of the fictional version of that too. Sure. And that there was that idea of we were creating distance by building these fictional versions of maybe all of our lives, but it was also an amalgamation of everything that came mm-hmm. up in that room and sort of this group therapy that we were hosting daily for hours and hours together and holding that space for each other it's beautiful huh. that is it sounds like a dream job I honestly <laughs> i'm curious as to if there's like a mental health professional mm-hmm. that's part of your team mm-hmm. to like support that mm-hmm. at all Yeah, so we did have a consultant on the show, and she was incredibly impactful because, again, her lived-in experience was very similar to Brooke's. Yeah. She is someone that, as a Black woman, had her own private practice for decades and lived a life that, in some ways, really spoke to how we were building Brooke and how Josh and Jen were writing this character and how, how Uzo performed her. And so she was someone that was always around to answer questions and that we would constantly get on as well to just have meetings with and Zooms with where we could really dig in, share some of where our stories were building, ask her questions even around the process of therapy Mm. and the authenticity and the reality of how we felt it should go because we were making an entertaining dramatic TV show and how it actually would Mm -hmm. go in her office Mm. and really having her come to us about things that she thought we should include or even very specific things that were pet peeves of hers as Mm. a therapist that she had seen, whether in, you know, the previous in treatment seasons or in other shows or films that centered therapy. And she had wishes even of like, I wish I could see Mm -hmm. this. Or, you know, I think a black therapist would do this Mm. different from a white male therapist or otherwise. So it was really impactful to have that kind of person again as part of our process and constantly someone that we can reach out to and lean into. Mm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I recognize the moments on screen that feel really real. They they feel very similar to what I might experience in session with a client. So can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the 
resources that writers used as they were thinking about developing this therapeutic framework, and it particularly uh, Dr. Brooks' character. Yeah, with Dr. Brooks' character, it's interesting because it came out of, you know, books that I was reading and trying to get in front of the showrunners and the writers. And so two of those that I had, you know, read in my training or again on my way to getting a license is The Gift of Therapy by uh, Dr. Irvin Yalom. And then the other one is The Making of a Therapist by Louis Cozzolino. And both of those books being two of the only books that I had read or known of that really centered therapy around the experience of what a therapist would be going through. Mm. And so those two books gave, you know, all of us, both the showrunners and the writers, um, a sense of how to get inside of Brooke's head and how to get inside of her head in terms of what might be happening in her chair right. versus what would be happening in the patient's chair. So, David, you mentioned the writers and the authenticity that they bring. So how did you divvy up episodes amongst those writers? Because from my understanding, it's not how most shows do that. So how did you guys do it? Yeah, with the show, the way Jen and Josh ran the process is they were the owners, right, of Brooke's story. Mm -hmm. Josh being a black man, a gay black man, and then Jen being a woman of experience with her therapist that goes back these decades they both wrote the sort of voice of Dr. Brooke. And, and they centered their episodes were around the fourth episode each week. So Brooke's story with Rita mm -hmm. and sort of what she's going through in her personal life. Mm -hmm. And then um, Jackie Sibley's Drury, who is a playwright and a professor at Yale for dramatic writing. She's a black woman who really owned Layla's story. Mm. And I think came at that from a place of, you know, the students that she had been with in the theater program at Yale and some of the people she'd mentored and also, again, coming from her mm. own life and mm. her own young adulthood right. and really being able to center some of her experiences and her beautiful writing around making the character of Layla really feel fully realized mm. and and having, you know, someone who is in those teen formative years be sitting across from Brooke and be someone that Brooke has to take a very different approach mm -hmm. to than all her other patients. Yes, absolutely. Chris Gabo was another one of our writers, also a playwright. And Chris Gabo is a uh, Latino playwright who came at this from Eladio in, in a lot of ways. We, we joke about this all the time. Like, Chris Gabo is Eladio. There is, <laughs> there's almost no way to separate the two entities. Yeah. And in a really beautiful way, like, even just having someone like Anthony Ramos sort of speak words mm -hmm. to Chris Gabo's writing they yeah. almost have the same patterns and, and speech. And Chris Gabo is that, like, Latin nerd that yeah. just loved Latin authors and literature and is a quiet, sensitive soul that really had this amazing sense yeah. of experience by becoming a writer himself mm -hmm. and sort of bringing that back. And then writing on our show, he was really able to dig into some living in an experience he had when he himself was a home health aide. Yeah. And he had had a relationship like this with someone that really questioned for him why he was doing what he was doing and even the friendship that he had with someone that mm -hmm. he was technically being paid to take after. Yeah. And so for him, it was something that came from a really incredible place and was pitched directly to Josh and Jen and then almost was presented right after that initial meeting and just built out that story yeah. and was one of the easiest arcs that we had because Eladio was something that he could speak to in a very direct way yeah. and a lot of that came from his own life and was really beautiful. And then Zach Whedon wrote our third patient, Colin, and Zach, again, is is this brilliant writer that has, you know, written things like Halt and mm -hmm. Catch Fire and just knew the pathos so well of someone who might be questioning his place in the world where we were having this incredible learning and leaning in mm -hmm. around the uprising and, and the murder of George Floyd and the idea that this was a moment where people like a Colin needed to actually sit with their identity and mm -hmm. see where they fit in and someone like him a narcissist that always was thinking of him first and was ego first mm -hmm. didn't know coming out of that jail time what his place was in the world mm -hmm. and having to dig into that and zach was someone that could really 
put intelligence and pathos around that in a way where it would have been harder for any of these other writers to maybe sure. write a character like that because they would come at it from a prejudiced place or just from a place of not being able to really root in and anchor into his issues. And Zach did a beautiful job of almost making us love and be humanized with someone that is so problematic yeah, and, yeah. and that we know is is tough to watch in these weeks. I don't love him. But. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, same. But I can't turn away from Colin because it's so specific and because it's so full. And I think that way about Brooke as well. Brooke is a, an addict and there's so much stigma in our country around addiction, but you can't help but feel for her because you see the specificity of her life and the fullness of her life and the fullness of all these characters. So it's really beautiful that each writer was responsible for that character and had some kind of relationship and was really able mm -hmm. to bring that to life and to, to pull out the empathy from the viewer, I think. Really cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the background of what went into the writer's process and how much of themselves they put into the show. That was really helpful for me to hear and illuminating, and it helped me understand why that sh the show resonates in the way that it does. So if the writers are listening, thank you for sharing yourself with us in this way, because that was, I know that that's not easy, and it feels really vulnerable and intimate. So thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. David, thank you so much for being here. This was an absolute joy, right, Dr. Janelle? We're just like yes. losing our minds. <laughs> so thank this you so much. Wonderful. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Of course. Thank you both for having me. And, you know, so love you bringing your expertise to the show and really opening up for us what actual therapy and mental health practices look like. And using our characters to launch that discussion is so important right now. Mm, thank you. Thank you, David. So this week, Dr. Brooke is in her second session with her three main patients, and she's, you know, starting to get the, the real tea, as we like to say. I'm excited to dive into this because there is a lot to go into, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to unpack the box, metaphorically speaking, in therapy, when you start to get into the heart and the root of what brought you into that therapeutic space. So I really love what you said about opening the box because we see that with everyone this week, starting with Eladio. I haven't slept better since we talked last. I slept worse. In what ways? Last four nights, I've had the same dream. About the snow in the ash. And even though I haven't thought about this guy in years, it was Sikander holding my hand. That was a lockbox and you unlocked it. And I, I can't afford that. Maybe if this was long term, if we were going to do this for like years, then maybe. N who's to say we can't? Dr. Taylor, you and I both know the financial realities that bar that from being the case. This is short term. And it's possible that what I need isn't a therapist, it's a pharmacist. Because the only thing that's going to help me sleep at all is a lithium. And if that sounds bad, I'm sorry. But that's my reality here. So what I love about what Eladio says, and Eladio is really the first one to kind of name the box. And I really related to this because I went to therapy and that was always my fear. And mm -hmm. like there were things that I wanted to deal with um, without going too much into detail. But the thing I said to my therapist is I'm afraid of kind of unlocking this Pandora's box. And like I don't have time to just like... I think the fear is you unlock the box and you break down and then you're not going to be able to do your job or show up or do your work. And when you're feeling like you're on survival mode, mm -hmm. um, how do you allow yourself to do the work? Because even when he says, if this were long term, but even for me, it was like it was open ended. And I still had this like, I don't know if I want to go there because I still got 15,000 things to do when I leave you. Oh, yes. I mean... Yes, and thinking about this idea of having the ability to engage with the full breadth of your experience being like a privilege that you some people feel that they can't afford, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's financially or time or constantly having to keep up. So, I mean, hearing a lot of you name that, I mean, it felt really powerfully true in a lot of ways. Emotions feel like a luxury mm -hmm. to that. 
a sense, you know, it's like it's a luxury for me to examine my emotions and allow myself the time to cry or scream or whatever. And it's like, I don't have that kind of time. I mean, and on the therapist side, we see that same thing show up with Dr. Brooke, right? Like mm. you kind of get this feeling that she's just been going nonstop, like achieving, yes. achieving, doing. And Rita kind of pulls her in and draws out these emotions that you feel like she's just been shoving down into this box. So you have this process, yeah, where she's encouraging her clients to dive in and Mm -hmm. do this work and to open their own, like, Pandora's boxes. And you wonder, is she doing the same thing for herself? She's definitely not. She is sitting on that. But I mean, every time we see her ignore a call, ignore this person, you know, try to close the door on that person, she's like sitting heavy on that box. And understandably, because you see the height at which she operates and Mm -hmm. has to operate too, the requirement at which level she has to operate. You were talking about these are why these three patients, right? So we're assuming that there are more patients than just mm-hmm. these three in her week. So if you think about all that responsibility, no wonder she's like, I am not dealing with any of this right now because yes. I'm just going to divert this to my patients and, and taking care of everybody else. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I always wonder from your like experience as an actor, as a writer, as a creative and all these different levels, it feels like the choices are so intentional in reflecting that process of keeping that box together and so tight because she always looks immaculate. Her yes. space <laughs> is gorgeous. Pristine. Even when she's like, <laughs> yeah, you're just like, was this an intentional choice to present her so polished, so together on the surface where you feel like this brewing turmoil right underneath? So. Uh, I, I'm one, when I'm feeling like trash, I, I will look my best. <laughs> like if I'm feeling like trash, I will look my best. I will clean the house from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. There's something about um, external order that kind of becomes a substitute for internal order, if that makes yeah. any sense. So I really see that present with with Dr. Brooke in how she's dressing and holding herself, which I'm sure she already does, but I feel like it's to another extreme probably than maybe if we caught her before the passing of her father. Mm-hmm. I feel like with Colin, we kind of saw the lid of that box come off for a moment. Oh, yeah. It was a little, it was like a little distressing. You're like, oh, okay. That, yes. That's a lot there. <laughs> yes. And he had to like, t- I physically turned himself around and apologize. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because in many ways, uh, I think it's because he's learned that taking that lid off the box is dangerous for him. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like we've learned what went on for him in prison and what got him there. And so like this idea that possibly there's a lid on his box for a reason mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and he might he might actually need the support of somebody to help him carefully unpack this box. I don't care if you like me. All right, I care if you sign that stupid form that says I can get the fuck on with my life so I can, I, I, I can do things and make things and, and build a life instead of driving up here to no man's land and pretend like I'm fucking getting somewhere. Jesus fucking Christ. You know, if I wanted to sit around talking about my fucking emotions all day, I'd still be married. Shit! Fuck! Oh, shit! Fuck! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did cackle when he said if I wanted to, I would talk, I would be married still. And I'm like, that's hilarious. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> that is all I think a good marriage is, is communicating your feelings, <laughs> uh, which clearly he does not <laughs> like to do. But yes, he, he is really protesting quite a bit, um, which is like, oh, I, you, you do care that people like you or don't yeah. like you. Like that is a, a hot button. But I, I was also going to say, That moment to me is why therapy and mental health and doing the work is important Mm -hmm. because I think it can help not prevent the blow-ups, but uh, shade and shift how you blow Mm -hmm. up because you're dealing with it constantly as opposed to suppress, 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 and now Mm -hmm. there's this massive fucking reaction. And a lot of times 
I would say that I've experienced that reaction from adults as a kid, right? Where, yeah. like, suddenly a kid, you know, you jump on the bed or you do something kid-like and your mm-hmm. parent is like, ah! yeah. and there's, oh, it's because you haven't dealt with some anger you've been holding on to for a while. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with the kid, but then we internalize that. And so you you end up scarring other people if you're not dealing with your own scars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... I feel like what you're naming is so important, that idea of, like, that emotional displacement, right? Mm -hmm. Where what you're reacting to is not the target of what you're really feeling. And it's like the uh, emotional law of conservation, right? Mm That emotional energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But this idea that if you don't engage with it, then it's going to pop up somewhere and it's yes. typically going to be disruptive. Like if you're not doing your maintenance, it is going to explode at a time where you least expect it. It feels yes. completely unwieldy. And then what sucks is then you're avoidant of dealing with emotions because you basically reinforce this idea that like, see, this is why I don't deal with you emotions because you're too much, right? (laughs) Yes. That idea that it'll be disruptive. Because even when he says, I'm sorry, it's like that, Mm -hmm. that like, oh, you see him go right back into his shell. And so you're like, well, there's nothing we haven't really accomplished. I mean, Maybe we've accomplished something because you've expressed something, but it's really easy for that person to then lock down even harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and you got to watch, like when you're watching Dr. Brooke, you have to wonder, like, that feels intentional. Like she mm-hmm. clearly was doing some challenge. She was clearly, it felt like she was pushing to bring him into authenticity and to start dealing with that core question about judgment. Like, why do you care what I think? Like, yeah. why? What is the shame that it, that we all experience that drives you into this darkest place of yourself? Like, yes. And let's talk about that because yes. we can talk about your behavior. We can talk about what you did and we can look at all the stuff that's on the surface. But let's get to the root. Let's stop. Let's get to the like, root. Yeah. 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 I also want to call out one of the ways that she got to the root. I think she was faking about her back. I don't think her mm-hmm. back. <laughs> You're like, What's wait, you guys seem tired in the other episode and then after it was good. So it's just like a 20 minute like, back issue. <laughs> I didn't see you do no yoga or nothing to pull your back in none of these other episodes. So where this back pain came from? <laughs> those clothes on like no but that tactic I was like oh that's a really you know she recognizes that this is somebody who you know needs control and was once quite powerful and is Mm -hmm. having a really hard and is allowing the power dynamics to get in the way of his work and so her being like okay let me find a way to uh, shift the power dynamic or make it feel like it's been shifted while also not hurting his feelings. Yeah. That was also interesting. Like, making up that lie about the back, or we're assuming it's a lie, um, about the back uh, as a way to not uh, make, like, tip him off to mm-hmm. to the tactic. I mm-hmm. thought it was really interesting. Oh, yeah. I love that observation and this idea of, like, what it kind of unlocked in the work when you throw things off kilter, and she's used that a few times, like yes. when she connected with Layla, taking her into the kitchen, right. and then here with this change of room, like this idea of her kind of tuning into what do we need to do to get the lock to start to open up that box so that yeah. you're not just playing here at the surface. Um, we're not, let's do the work that you came in here to do. And especially with Colin, you're like, we're on a time clock here. We need to get yes. into it. How about we get back to Eladio, right? At the very end of his mm-hmm. session, we really saw that she was getting somewhere and, almost, and lost track of time. And mm-hmm. what came up for me, and I was really excited to ask you, was, you know, one, more importantly for, I think, for the client, how do you keep yourself safe? Knowing that there's a good chance that the box will open in kind mm-hmm. of the last few minutes of your session and yeah. you still have probably a whole day of work to tend to. Um, How do you keep yourself safe and protected, yet also open enough to, you know, let that lid of the box fall off? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's one of the core responsibilities of a therapist. And she even names that, I think, where she talks about 
you know, I pride myself on having this internal clock. Like she does this all day. Mm-hmm. You're just like used to hitting something. It's something that's so internalized. You have that muscle memory. So it really kind of underscores the fact that Eladio is bringing something else out in her, right? Yeah. What happened? I am so sorry. We went over, and and my next patient is here. And okay, my bad. No, 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 no worries at all. Um. I pride myself on my sixth sense when it comes to session length, so this is very... Do you have extra time later today to talk? But I do think, as a therapist, that's one of the primary, like, responsibilities, especially when you are diving into work that can feel like you're opening that significant emotional box. Yeah. Your job is to be like, yeah, I'll keep the parameters. I'll keep the framework. You won't have to think about time. Mm -hmm. Like, you be in the moment. You fully embody whatever is going on and know that I'll keep the guardrails. And as you were talking about the therapist keeping the guardrails, I thought, oh, maybe there are guardrails that the client can also have, which for Mm -hmm. me, I think is I stopped scheduling therapy, like, right before something else. Oh, yes. So that's, like, my big guardrail is that, like, therapy is before lunch or it's before, Mm -hmm. you know, so that I know that I have like 30 or 40 minutes afterwards if I need to process on my own or be by myself, that that's in place should I have Mm -hmm. a doorknob moment where like Mm -hmm. I literally am like unpacking something traumatic in those last five minutes that I want to make sure that I don't have to go right into a new space with all that energy. Oh, yeah. I mean, because it's it's like that's sort of unfair to you, right? Yeah. Yes. So I love, I mean, I love hearing about like holding that buffer. And I think that's even harder, like when we're doing more teletherapy and sure. in this like virtual therapy, because people are just like doing these quick changes that can give you that emotional whiplash. Yes. So that's awesome. That is a yeah. great like tip for like people to hold <laughs> on to. Um, but yeah, I do think, and I think that communication is so important, like being able to do these like pauses and check ins and see like what's coming up for you and being mm-hmm. able to say, I feel like we're approaching something and like I'm noticing my early signs of dysregulation, right? Yeah. Or, like, I'm noticing that like, yeah, I'm noticing that my heart is racing a little bit. I'm feeling a little uh, like my gut just like feels a little un- unstable. Mm-hmm. Being able to kind of name that and, and open the communication. Dr. Janelle, uh, what is dysregulation? Um, so dysregulation is particularly when we're talking about um, emotional reactions and those like physical signs that come along with it, it's when we feel off kilter, that feeling of often feeling out of control. And it can come up when there's something that cues a strong emotion for you. And particularly in the moment, if you don't have the tools to be able to engage with it. Um, And so being able to pick up on early signs of what could dysregulate you are really important. Mm. When we think about Eladio, a good sign that he was dysregulated was the his voice raising, him sort of, of his, like, outburst kind of of saying, why are you pushing me? Why are you putting these words in my mouth? And that sort of, that strong, almost, like, flood of emotion that comes mm. up. My job. And if I can't do my job, I don't eat because I'm not good at anything else. So just, if you, if you want to talk about whatever... Right? From now on, you want to talk about whatever. You want to talk about my mom, my fucking ex, my... I'm down. But do me a favor. And let's just put an embargo on this particular topic. Okay? With all due respect. And even, like, sometimes when we talk about, um, like, being dysregulated, we talk about flooding, which I love because it is that... Um, your central nervous system gets to a point sometimes when you are dysregulated where you feel off kilter and unsafe to the point that you honestly can't even process like it suppresses your executive functioning that kind of logical place in your brain and you're just in this like gut intuitive instinctual space Mm. um, that doesn't necessarily respond to logic and that's why it's so annoying when you're feeling wholly dysregulated and somebody's like calm down yeah yeah, oh god <laughs> oh my goodness, that never works. Calm down never works. <laughs> kind of like when Dr. Brooks said, uh, I don't want you to be too emotional. That was uh, this episode's version of calm down. Yes. <laughs> 
Do you have extra time later today to talk? Dog, Mrs. DeMarco's already out of pocket. She ain't gonna pay for more time. No, no, no. It's not about the money. I'll just check in later to make sure you're in a less emotional place. Emotional? I'm not emotional. I'm good. How about we get to Layla's week? Because her first week was pretty rough, but this second week, she really opens up about something that, for me, is really big, which is uh, the race fantasy she had. It's just you and your grandma. Yeah. Um. And so, we're driving down the street, and I look in the rearview mirror, and that woman is, like, still coming towards us. <laughs> I mean, like... Fuck, like, even now I can, like, um, like, feel the panic. But you know it's not real. Yeah, but it's not the, it's just, like, the panic of, like, needing to get away, you know? Um, and, like, a, ahead of us, is like this barricade that people have made with um, with couches and cars, and standing right in the middle of it is this like white guy with a rifle. And he takes one look at us and goes, "Oh, you people cannot pass here." And so I just, all of a sudden, just ram straight into the barricade, and the car just explodes. But I pull my grandma out before it does, and the guy, I, I don't know, he like trips on something or he gets his foot stuck in something. <laughs> I don't help him. Me and Grandma just watch him burn. I thought this was so vulnerable to share. Um, and in thinking about judgment, this is definitely something that I would be afraid of being judged for, and I don't know if I would have mm -hmm. shared on the second uh, the second session, because you never want to be looked at as uh, somebody who could, or I never want to be looked at, let me do I statements, as somebody who would hurt somebody else, like who would actively try and hurt somebody yeah. else. So trying to reckon with, I would never hurt anybody, but I also have this traumatic fantasy mm -hmm. Of, of hurting somebody or not helping somebody um, feels like an easy way to be judged. And so I, I was really impressed that Layla um, felt either safe enough or or something to share this, this piece. Yeah, no. I mean, and thinking about, like you said, this idea of having the safety to bring something that feels mm -hmm. really vulnerable. Like when we think about like vulnerability, I think we might have talked about this before, that vulnerability involves risk. Like you are taking a step that opens you up, particularly to the potential of being shamed or being mm. judged. And there's so much there that um, Dr. Brooke can engage with when she's thinking about Layla and what this means for her. Like, what does this fantasy communicate? So if we can get past the judgment and see what it's signaling and what work, like, there might be to explore yeah. together, that's kind of cool. I mean, I, lo I love, like, Carl Rogers. Like, when we think of, like, the whole idea of therapy, one of the most necessary ingredients is that unconditional positive mm. regard and um even it's so i'm, I'm gonna geek out here for a second <laughs> i love i love <laughs> when you do i love when you do pushing up my glasses but i mean and in the research we see like it doesn't matter like what modality it is there's all different types of therapy the number one predictor of change in a therapeutic relationship is a client's like response to the question of how much they think that their clinician mm, cares about them yeah right like that relationship that alliance yeah. And so, yeah, it was kind of cool that e even in the second session that she felt like that she could share something and you can even see her kind of testing and opening up. Like, are you going to say anything? Like, 
what what did you make of that? And Dr. J, who's Carl Rogers? Oh, Carl Rogers. Well, he was a, uh, a pioneer in like a really foundational part of the development of a client-centered approach to therapy, which mm. really was at the time pretty revolutionary. The idea that your therapeutic work should focus on your client as a human being and that the the work is driven from that space of creating acceptance, non-judgment in a place mm. where they can feel safe to be there themselves. Well, let me geek out for a second. I'm going to geek out. Yes, because I'm going to geek out on kind of the the writing and acting side of it, which was, one, They, I thought both of them were phenomenal in this scene. But in watching it, I realized I had never heard anything like that on TV or in a movie, just like the space and the freedom to really have a, a Black person, a Black woman in particular, lay out the details of this very traumatic fantasy that I think, you know, as Dr. Brooke pointed out, is a coping mechanism that I can definitely see myself in. Like, it, it's so specific that I, it's not something that you bring up at a dinner party. I have fantasies sometimes about these things happening. Um, but I do think in the quietness, I think that's why it shook me, because I was like, oh my goodness, I, I think that I have had not that particular fantasy, but you know, you're prepping. You're, you, if you're if you're black in this in America, uh, I think it's uh, naive to think that on some level your brain or your mind or your body is not prepping for some really terrible shit to happen to you or somebody you love or around you. And so the, these fantasies do happen because you're like, what do I do in that moment? What would I do in that moment? This moment that is. Light. I mean, to, to you know, Dr. Brooke at the end, thinking about her son, not to jump too far, but her saying it's a young black man, maybe he's dead, right? Like that reality of like, oh yeah, like there is trauma here as black people. So it's not surprising that Layla has this fantasy that may not be uh, polite to share in quote unquote mixed company, but it makes sense that she would have that. I'm so glad that you named that because she says you grew up in a world full of violence and malice mm -hmm. and thinking about this sort of immersion that has an impact on us psychologically it takes a toll and then when we go back to this idea of repressing it and keep on moving forward you have to continue to exist mm -hmm. there's no immediate clean fix you have to navigate it but at the same time you're hyper vigilant all the time you're in the state yeah. of trying to get mentally prepared and rehearsing like what yes. am i going to do right yes i mean i definitely i know for me like as, as a black woman i had like a horrific experience with the police and mm. ever since then like you're constantly saying okay what am I going to do and of course you're trying to prepare for this year I think Dr. Brooks said it sometimes you're kind of chasing smoke like because at the end of yeah. the day you also feel like there's nothing you can do to really yeah. be prepared but um, yeah, Layla has created this. She clearly has this vivid internal space that she escapes into to try to make sense of her experience mm -hmm. when she is describing kind of these things that are risky, like for the the safety of Layla, especially with her in that like cusp of being a teenager and like just turning mm -hmm. 18. There are these questions of, you know, that frontal lobe is not developed yet. Like, yeah. to, so <laughs> you gotta, you know, you gotta worry about like, yeah, safety and her getting those, um, getting more information about what's going on. So we're coming to the end of our time today, and I want to make sure to leave you, Brandon, and also our listeners with some resources and recommendations. So let's get into it. To start off, a little bit earlier, I spoke about Unconditional Positive Regard, which is connected to humanistic therapy and Carl Rogers, I think, on becoming a person, a therapist's view of psychotherapy 
is a wonderful sort of primer into that humanistic approach and client-centered approach to therapy. That's what we want therapy to be. (laughs) Um, And also, I think that there's this question about shame as well that came up throughout and as we were talking about judgment. And Brené Brown is definitely a queen Uh, in this area when it comes to thinking about shame. Uh, There's some great... TED Talks, if somehow you are like the one person on the planet who's not seen her TED Talk on shame, (laughs) do it like today. Um, And Daring Greatly, her book is pretty next level um, when we think about shame and vulnerability and how it unlocks different aspects of our relationships and our life so when we dive into that um, and I love also the work that Not So Strong does which looks at vulnerability in black women and the particular culturally informed way of like what it looks like to be vulnerable to show up to like take off your cape like put it away and not yeah. have to be that strong black woman archetype so those are all some 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 different follow up resources that might be helpful. I love that. Yeah, and when Eladio said that he was trying to choose between money and his therapeutic work, my heart kind of broke open a little bit. Um, mm. And I know that for many people, uh, therapy is an investment, and sometimes that investment cost can be a barrier. Which, the thinking about, I wanted to make sure that y'all have some resources in terms of when it comes to affordable therapy. Open Path Collective has some really great affordable therapeutic options Um, and the Loveland Foundation in particular was developed to give scholarships for therapy to black women um, diving into their therapeutic work that's amazing yeah so check them out check out those resources Yes. yes and you can find these and other recommendations on the in treatment page on HBO's website looks like that's our time for this week Brandon (laughs) Uh, it is and it's i hate it so much when we have to end but we'll be back next week y'all be sure to subscribe to in session the in treatment podcast so you do not miss us and while you're doing that subscribing why not give us a rating and review it can help others find the show in session is the official companion podcast for the hbo show in treatment and is a production of hbo and pineapple street studios production music is courtesy of hbo and audio blocks. You can watch new episodes of In Treatment on Sunday and Monday nights on HBO Max. Dr. J, it is always a pleasure, and I guess I'll see you next week. I can't wait. (laughs) Yay! Bye. Bye! (laughs) (laughs) You're cute. Name a more iconic duo than Dr. J and BKG. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.